guys uh i've got maxwell finn on the line here with me so if you are watching the replay right now give me a heart give me a like uh give us comments down below any questions that you have we'll a we'll answer them after the live as well um but if you guys are just tuning in right now um and have any questions on the actual live uh max and i will be happy to take them um but max uh just so i don't do you any disjustice do you want to introduce yourself <laughs> I always have fun with this one. Um, right. It's funny. It's funny. I like flip flop and and uh, I did a live in our group today with my buddy Demetrius and and uh, I like to do the same thing because I hate like reading people's bios because it's usually just it's like a lot of boring stuff. Um, yeah. But I'll give you the the really short short version. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. My dad's an entrepreneur. My grandpa's an entrepreneur. Um, they, they started the first privately owned commercial real estate company, uh, network of independently owned commercial real estate companies, and it became the largest privately owned commercial real estate company and at Global before they sold it. No, I didn't want to get into real estate, more interested in marketing technology. Started my first uh, startup while I was still in school. We raised a few million dollars, built that team to like 30 people. Um, we had a mobile app for basically incentivizing long tail uh, influencers. So brands connecting with influencers, they could pay them cash, all kinds of rewards. We didn't have wallet and have payments. Um, really cool stuff back in like 2011 to 2013. Um, started my first e-commerce store towards the end of that startup drugs, which is kind of the e-commerce store a lot of people know about today. Uh, that was supposed to be a joke, but it, it actually took off and uh, thanks to Product <laughs> Hunt and, and did really well. But it, it's kind of just something we keep up because it's fun and a lot of we have a lot of cool customers. Uh, got me super passionate in e-commerce and, and mainly direct response marketing on like the back of it. The, seeing the power of Facebook ads early on and like just how mm -hmm. insane it was um, for, for growth. I got really passionate about that, really into it and took a deep dive. And that was kind of the platform I got really immersed into. Um, and, and really just the last few years, I've been focusing uh, pretty heavily on Facebook. I mean, obviously, when you build multiple companies, you get good at a lot of things. But really, mm -hmm. the, the direct response aspect of it, Facebook specifically, e-com funnels, um, CRO messenger is kind of a newer thing that we're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, we built an agency with Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank called Quantum Media that we grew together for about a year and a half. Um, we got to work with companies like 3M and Sam's Club and, and big Fortune 500s, along with a lot of Kevin's companies. He was a great mentor. We still do a lot of deals with him and his son, Brian. They're just incredible people. And uh, that to flash forward to the last nine months, uh, my partner, Jeremy Adams, myself, we've been through multiple companies together. Mm -hmm. I have a company called Unicorn Innovations. Um, we started basically like it's boutique consulting. We, we don't do a lot. We take on very, very few clients. Usually they're doing seven to eight figures. And um, we have our educational side of the business. So we have our core side of the business. Our Facebook course is our first one that we launched in August. That did incredible out of the gate. Now we have uh, AdWords, Instagram, LinkedIn, rolling out more. We also have private group coaching. Um, we're starting to do masterminds. And so it's kind of a hybrid like training service business. And, uh, and then we just launched Unicorn Capital. Where we actually started to invest in businesses. So we have two partners from Bain Capital that uh, now we're funding stores and businesses about to launch that. So it, it's been a, a really crazy like 10, or, you know, 10 to 12 years that I've been like active as, as an entrepreneur you know, from mm -hmm. early college. And it's taken about you know, 10 or 11 of those 12 years to become successful. So it's really the last like nine months that everyone focuses on. Um, but it <laughs> took all those years to get to a point where all those things started falling into line. So that's that's my entire life from a business standpoint. But the, mo the most important thing is that, um, you know, I was able to accomplish a lot of really great personal goals as well in the last year. So I've nice. been uh, in a relationship for the last four years with uh, Larissa is my, now my fiance, pros through last year. We're getting married November 3rd uh, and we have two awesome dogs. So that's like the most important part of it. The business part of it's the business, but that's like, that's stuff I'm most proud about. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, I have so many questions for you, but if you 20 people that are on here right now, if you're excited to have Max here, give us a heart, give us a like, uh, all that good stuff to keep us going, to fuel us. We need fuel, some love. Fuel by likes, not right <laughs> Exactly, and social proof. Um, but it's been such a long journey for you to get from point zero to where you're at now. And I'm just wondering what really has made the biggest impact from then until now. If you if somebody's just starting out their entrepreneurial journey and they want to know how to level up as quick as possible, what would you suggest to them? So 
I was, I'm, I still am, I'm working on it, being less stubborn and like trying to do everything myself. Um, one of my biggest weaknesses, and this will spin into what you should do, is like try, we as entrepreneurs uh, have a habit of like wanting to control everything. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that that works for us early on when we're building businesses because you gotta wear multiple hats. So that mm -hmm. model like works really well when you're like bootstrapping and trying to do everything. It is detrimental when you try to grow a business. So that can mm -hmm. get you off the ground and to like an MVP, that will never get you to seven or eight figures. Like it just, it destroys your business. So right. um, for me, it was like learning how to, to delegate and more importantly, surround myself with like smarter, more talented people, both on like a team level and then also on a partnership and mentor level. Like mm -hmm. if, right, if right now you don't have, if you can't think of in your head, who can I call right now? Who's a mentor? Who's somebody that's like super experienced, super successful that I could call or text right now and ask a question? You need to find that person. Mm -hmm. uh, every entrepreneur, every marketer, doesn't matter if you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 20s, teens, like it doesn't matter where you're in your career, you should have somebody that's a, ahead of you that you can reach out to and throw ideas off of and talk about ideas and like get their input. That has been the biggest factor professionally for me, like going from like this to like this is mm -hmm. just starting to surround myself with people who are rock stars and mm -hmm. get in their, their bubbles and their ecosystems. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. I'm just starting to see that now in my business, starting to outsource a little bit more just because I can't do everything that I wanna get done in my business. And it's helped out a lot, especially hiring a personal assistant. I don't know if you have one, but that is, VAs, yeah. Yeah, that has organized my life so, so much. Um, but for the people that don't know you, um, the few that are on here right now, how would you uh, tell us what you help people do on the, uh, coaching slash course side of things? Sure. So we have, you know, uh, every, every business needs to have a value ladder, right? You need to have entry level products and need to have 10, you know, five figure, six figure and up products. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what I realized was when I was first starting out and in the last maybe three, starting like three years ago to maybe a year ago, I was a behind the scenes person. And so I was building the Facebook ads and the funnels, and the campaigns for, you know, Kevin, Harry and Pat Flynn and, and 3M and big people or big companies. And uh, what I realized was like, you can only help so many people and impact so many people doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I, I really didn't like the coaching and teaching and course space. I, I just, I really, really didn't like it because it was <laughs> cluttered with people who I knew had never spent a dollar on Facebook ads or never built a Shopify store or anything. I just, mm -hmm. I small world, you know, the people who are doing it and you know, the people who aren't doing it. Yeah. And, um, but what I, what I realized though, is the, the worst thing you can do is to see a problem and decide like, well, I don't want to address it or do anything. Cause I don't want to be part of the problem. Like, so, so I looked at it and said, well, I can either just accept that world as it is, or I can say, well, I'm going to put a course out and start teaching because if there's all these hardworking entrepreneurs and business owners who are spending their last thousand dollars or bootstrap cash or borrowed money, whatever it is to buy a course, they might as well get a course that's actually going to help them grow their business. Right. And, and what I realized was we found this sweet spot where if you're in between a practitioner and a teacher, you can have really magical stuff. Like that's where the magic happens. So we get to on a regular basis, build really cool campaigns for big individuals, big companies, big offers. We get to see what's working because we're actually doing it. We're spending millions of dollars mm -hmm. and then we get to teach about it. And it's this really cool hybrid model that I think we've, we've kind of stumbled onto after lots and lots of trial and error. And, uh, and now we're just rolling with it. It's just like this beautiful thing. I, I totally have gotten off topic, but, um, no, go ahead. It's, this beautiful thing where it's like we're doing things, cool things, we're teaching about it. And then through teaching about it and being more public, we're attracting cooler and cooler businesses and individuals who are mm -hmm. giving us big opportunities to run traffic. And then we teach that. And it's this really cool ladder effect that we've noticed since last year where the teaching of the strategies is brought in bigger fish that we can get bigger strategies and test cooler things with, which now lets us level up our game with our teaching. And now we have some big offers in place from the teaching side. That's going to allow us to reach a lot more people with some big partnerships. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's cool. Sometimes you kind of stumble on things.
it's it's yeah. a lot of trial and error but every now and then you get you get lucky and you find something that works yeah absolutely i i feel like at least 50 percent of entrepreneur just everyday life is serendipity and just stumbling yeah. upon something that's freaking awesome so back to um, what you asked, like, what do I do? And so, so basically, I yeah. What do you, what do you help people accomplish? I, I yeah. So we really, really focus specifically on uh, scaling customer acquisition. So we help businesses grow their customer base and make more money with their customers. Um, mm-hmm. That's what we focus on. We don't focus. Mm-hmm. You know, we have partners that do everything else, right? All of the other pieces are important. Your, your community manager and your organic team and your SEO team and your native team and, and all that stuff is important. But like, if you can't get customers and you can't increase lifetime value of customers and make sure you're profitable on the acquisition, like nothing else matters. And uh, and we love this space because of how competitive it is. Like mm-hmm. everybody's a social media agency right now. You know, Ty, Ty Lopez right. has made, you know, tens of millions of dollars selling how to start your agency course to all those people. So now those tens of millions of dollars worth of sales, those people in all the agencies. Exactly. And, uh, with agencies, and again, I'm not bashing that much. I think if you, you can make that work and you can have business grow, that, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. The problem with the social media route is it's very, very difficult for a client to track ROI with right. organic social. Organic social SEO content, that's, that's a long-term play. It's critical to your business, but it's a long-term play. It's harder to measure a tangible ROI. With mm-hmm. the stuff we do, like, Somebody gives us money each month and they look at how much we brought them back then in month. And if you mm-hmm. can't make it work, you're fired. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a, it, like the bar is really, really high. And and I love that. Like I love operating in a, a stressful environment where it's every month you need to perform. And if you don't, there's no wiggle room, right? Mm-hmm. You can't say, well, Facebook's algorithm change and the organic reach decrease and where everyone else's reach decrease. So we need to you know modify. And they're like, okay, you can go another few months. So yeah. It's like, no, you're losing me money. We're going to go somebody else. Yeah. And that's the beauty of Facebook ads and lead generation. There's a direct and measurable aspect to it where if it's just um, you're running their Instagram and just managing their Facebook, then there really isn't that aspect to it. Um, You got to guess and all that good stuff. Um, But we have a question down here from Sean and we'll just dig into him. Um, he's asking, where did you find them in terms of uh, mentors in person or did you just uh, find them online? That's a good question. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer in that every single person gets lucky and gets opportunities. So I I, to- I totally think it's BS. People say like, well, that person got a lucky break or that person got a lucky break and that person got an opportunity. No, you, you get lucky every day, throughout the day, multiple times through the year, you get opportunities. The difference with successful people and non-successful people is that the most successful people uh, can identify when they're getting lucky and they act. A lot of people, when they're presented with opportunities, they think of reasons not to act and they, they don't pass by. Um, mm-hmm. The reason I'm bringing that up is because like the opportunities we got by just being active in the space, going to events, putting ourselves out there, we were naturally mm-hmm. presented with opportunities. And so one of the opportunities was to help Kevin Harrington with the social media or not even to help him. We were just kind of like my, my partner, Jeremy was, did a business pitch competition in front of him. Uh, and then after the fact, he won the competition for his food truck company and, awesome. uh, and realized that Kevin's social didn't have a social media presence really for how big of a figure, you know, two seasons of shark tank invented the infomercial last on TV didn't have a social media presence. And a lot of people, would just leave it at that, right? They would say, okay, here's a big, huge guy. He probably has a team. He probably has a bunch of people doing this. He's, he probably would get, he'd probably think me saying, can I help you with that is going to be insulting or just say no. And they wouldn't take that opportunity. Like Jeremy did and mm-hmm. said, hey, I would love, like, this is what we, this is what I do is before I even met Jeremy, I'd love to help you for free. Mm-hmm. And that rolled into, him helping and then I met Jeremy and then we started helping that rolled into then some projects together and that rolled into us starting a company together. And now a few years later, like we've done multiple business deals with Kevin, we're good friends with him. And that opened up a door to a bunch of other high level people. Cause now mm-hmm. it's, Hey, we were business partners, with Kevin Harrington. Oh, well now we get another opportunity and mm-hmm. then you get another opportunity. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden you're doing a deal with Pat Flynn. And then that, that so it's, it's this domino effect. Mm-hmm. So again, get at the point, like there, there isn't a, 
a de facto answer of like, this is where you go to find mentors, or yeah. this is where you go to find somebody to teach you. It's the, the point is that like throughout this year, there's going to be some instances where you're going to be in scenarios where there is somebody that is very successful, rich, powerful, that's going to be in the same room as you. And the difference between, you know, where we're, we are and everyone else is that like, we went over and talked to them mm -hmm. and we asked for help. We asked how I could help you like that. That is and this, the one last thing here for, cause I, I lose my thought all the time. This is a really important point. The craziest thing with Kevin is like, he is the, and it's, it's not just Kevin. It's a lot of people at high profile like him, but he is the most down to earth, open, like nice guy ever. He will stand and talk to everybody. Um, and the perception a lot of people have when they're getting started is why would a billionaire or yeah. a shark like want to talk to me? Why would they, why would they want to mentor me? Why would they want to help me for free? They charge $10,000 a day to consult with Sprint. Like, why would they want to do that? The truth yeah. is like those guys at that level. And I've even experienced this a little bit, just a little bit of success I've had. Like money stops being a driving factor. It, mm -hmm. it, it stops pretty quickly. Like once you get to the point where like not, like there's no more needs, like everything's taken care of, mm -hmm. it doesn't drive you as much as like impact and leave mm -hmm. my mark and helping people. And what I can tell you is those guys and those women that are super successful, multimillionaires, multi-billionaires, like they want to leave a legacy and they want to help young entrepreneurs. They want to help people getting started. That's mm -hmm. what they want to do. And uh, you're helping them as much as they're helping you. So next time you get that opportunity, bring a room with Grant mm -hmm. Cardone or Kevin Harrington or Gary Vee or Russell Brunson or Ezra Fires, mm -hmm. whoever it is, like walk over and talk to them, share mm -hmm. your story. Hey, say, Hey, I, uh, you know, if this one be posing, I, I would love maybe if I could talk to you next month and, and ask you some questions or pick your brain. Um, and if there's anything I can do to help you. I'd love to do that. It, all, you know, the worst thing that happens is say, listen, it's, it's, um, I'm really busy. Unfortunately, I can't help you out. It's the worst thing that happens and you right. move on. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. I had I had something similar happen to me, but in the online space. So you don't even need to be in person to really provide value to somebody. Uh, with Josh Forty, how we started off our friendship was I saw he didn't have a messenger bot. I reached out to him and said, hey, I can build you out a messenger bot for free. And he's like, heck yeah, dude, let's do it. Um, actually, Arnie introduced us, Arnie Giske, because we were down in... Um, uh, the Bahamas together. And he introduced me to Josh and I said, Josh, I can build you out the uh, messenger bot for free. And he's like, heck yes, let's do it. And then from there, our friendship has taken off and we're really good buddies now. So it's just all about providing that value up front. Um, and, and it's a domino people, effect, right? Because I saw your yeah. Facebook and I know Josh because Josh and I have done a lot of things. We've done some things together. And I was like, well, this guy's mm -hmm. like, this is incredible. These results. And he's talked mm -hmm. and he's done stuff with Josh and he's done stuff with these guys. Like I want to reach out to him. And mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's amazing. You can trace back like all these dominoes to a single message or a single conversation, a single phone it's call. It's so incredible. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you gotta keep doing it. The more you do it, the more people you're going to meet, the more your network opens up and it's insane. It's amazing. Just be able to provide things up front. Don't be stingy about them and just like be there to genuinely help somebody. Um, yeah. it, it has such a, it, it's so crazy. I know we want to get to other questions like, but like after this call, so I, I talked to, uh, he's from a buddy of mine now, which is crazy. Like Adrian Morrison is probably one of the, he's Adrian Morrison and Chris record are the two biggest Shopify affiliates, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Shopify is a multi-billion dollar public company. Those yeah, two guys drive nice. the most. Sales. Chris Record was doing he was doing seven figures a month in affiliate commissions for Shopify, and Adrian was pretty close. And, and I met both of them. I got invited to a Shopify mastermind last year. Um, it was twenty five people. And how I got there, it's a whole domino effect of how I got to that event. But I remember going to that event and feeling so intimidated because it was basically like Chris Record, Adrian Morrison, Ezra Firestone, Evan and Steve Tan, like all the biggest guys in the e commerce world in a room mm -hmm. in New York. It was crazy. And mm -hmm. um, and I just put myself out there and I figured out like, usually in those situations, you're like, well, what can I provide these guys? Like they're killing it. What can I help them with? And the mm -hmm. reality is that you're there for a reason. Like everybody needs help with everything. Mm -hmm. And it got to the, I put myself out there and started having conversations with pretty much everybody there. And now we're, you know, I spoke at Chris records mastermind in Orlando when he was here uh, and we talk regularly, we're doing deals together. Adrian and I, I did his webinar. Like he did my webinar. Like we're talking it's Ezra. I spoke at his event. And it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing what happens once you get over that little hurdle of like feeling intimidated 
mm-hmm. just put yourself out there, you start to realize all these guys that are, you know, they're not that much older than us. I'm much bigger than us, but like yeah. they need things too. And the reasons are where they're at is because they partner with other smart up and comers. Like they're yeah. that that's how they make a lot of money by finding yeah. new talent and getting their strategies and getting them on webinars to sell things with them. Like it, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I love that point. And, and I made a post today uh, going over like, you don't uh, stop asking what and how and start asking who, who do I need yeah. to meet to really level me up? And have you made the dream 100 list? Have you written that out yet? Of, of who I'd want to meet, like my yeah. my top 100 list? Yeah. Um, I haven't done like a full 100 list, but there's definitely, uh, I mean, there's definitely a, a decent list of, of people that I would I would love to meet and spend time with um, and pick their brain. And it's like a range yeah. of people. And it also includes people that I've kind of have met, but like not in a context where I got to sit down with them and, and like really pick their brain and, and chat with them and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the people that are on the live right now, um, let us know who's the number one person you'd like to meet to be your mentor. I'm really interested to see what your responses are. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We don't. Okay. Uh, Mark Foster has a question for you and came in late, Maxwell. Uh, can you uh, can you sum up your thoughts on the... Okay. This is actually what I was going to ask. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but there's some big changes, changes? coming to I Facebook. I don't, I don't know if you knew that or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Um, I know you've talked to some people about it. I think you interviewed somebody um, about it as well. Um, what are your interpretations of the changes and all that good stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's um, and it's funny that I'm watching this list. And I can introduce you to some of these people. So, Derek, I can introduce you to Scott if you want to meet Scott. He's a great guy. I, I know this, it's, it's cool being able to, to connect people. Um, yeah. But uh, – so here's the thing with Facebook. It, it, this situation is a little unique. It, it's a little bigger and, and di- different than the past. But historically, Facebook has a, a PR system. They, they have a, a strategy for how to deal with things like this. Because it's not the first time they dealt with it. It's not going to be the last time they deal with it. They've consistently yeah. dealt with this um, over the last you know 10 years or whatever. Uh, you don't become the biggest utility and social network in the world without dealing with privacy issues on a regular basis. And so their model is usually, you know, the first few days, let the fire build, ignore, 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 ignore. And then like three, four days in, go full steam in, admit, apologize. Mark Zuckerberg does all the press tours. Then you do a, a fix. You, you put out a solution. Here's what we're going to do. And then a wave dies down. Like that, they, that's the exact mm-hmm. blueprint they've rolled out every time this has happened. This, this one is, is a little different. Um, and, and it's definitely has more legs than the past ones do. And, and Facebook is definitely acting. They're reacting, which is unusual for them to do. Yeah. It, it's unusual for them to, to take, usually they'll take like one step forward in like fixing things instead of going like full mm-hmm. 10. Um, this mm-hmm. time, like they're doing things, they're removing behavioral targeting, but they're, they're taking five, six steps ahead. Now, who this is going to hurt. This is really important. Like Facebook is a $480 billion public company. They're mm-hmm. a two, they have 2 billion users. They're deeply integrated with pretty much every major corporation on the planet, right. including all the governments. Like Facebook is not going anywhere. And Facebook has a fiduciary duty to their stockholders first to do what's in the best interest of the business, regardless of mm-hmm. what Mark Zuckerberg says for PR, that he cares about the users over dollars. Mm-hmm. So, they're going to make pushes on the ad platform. They're going to try to plug holes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. These changes are going to hurt the lowest rung of advertiser. So it's going to hurt the, and I'm sorry if there's anybody on here, but this is just the truth. It's going to hurt the, the, you know, general store drop shippers. It's going to hurt the, you know, fly by night affiliate marketers. It's basically going to hurt anybody that needed to be profitable on the first sale for the product and mm-hmm. didn't have the ability or doesn't have the ability to increase lifetime value of a customer. So mm-hmm. if right now your business is 100% dependent in order to be profitable about a business, to be profitable acquiring a customer, you're you're in trouble, not just from Facebook, but across the board. Ad, co- ad costs across the board are going up. 
And so the businesses that are winning are the businesses that understand that I, you know, I don't need to make money acquiring customer because I have so many products and I have such a long value, you know, value ladder mm-hmm. and I have such repeat purchase rate and brand loyalty that it's worth it for me to break even because I know that this one customer is going to be worth four or five X what I pay for them. And mm-hmm. they're going to bring in people from their sphere, the brand loyalty, the UGC, all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's part one that if you don't have that in place, the ability to maximize lifetime value, increase average order value, all those things. And Russell talks about it all the time. Russell says like, he wants to be the person that basically pays, and it's not the exact quote, but basically like he wants to be the person that that can pay most for a customer. Like mm-hmm. he wants to outbid you. He will outbid mm-hmm. you in any auction for a customer because he knows if he gets that customer, I can make so much more money from that customer. And he does, mm-hmm. like it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's part one. And the part two is also like, the the targeting and the algorithm and all the stuff on the back end and the, the hacks and the, on the tech side of it like that's part of it and Hokey gets really excited about this stuff she she wants to come <laughs> up here and, and she gets excited about about Facebook ad talk um, uh. so that's part of it but like people click an ad they pay attention to it, and they buy a product because of the creative because of the story because of the product like mm-hmm. that is what grabs their attention that's what they buy. You could have the worst targeting in the world and everything else could suck. But if you have an incredible video, an incredible offer, an incredible product, you mm-hmm. could still get by. If you don't have any of that and you have great targeting, like yeah. you could actually pretty much go out of business. Like it doesn't matter. So the, what we're going to see is a transition to get rid of the low quality advertisers don't fit that bill. And you're going to see a lot more high quality videos, high quality creatives, high quality offers, a lot less scammy salesy stuff because mm-hmm. those people just aren't going to be able to do it profitably. Um, Mm -hmm. And the cool thing, the last part is by getting rid of all those people, what it does is it can bring ad costs back down because Mm -hmm. Facebook's an auction platform, which means that it's basic economics, it's supply and demand. So Mm -hmm. for the last year or so, there's been no more ad inventory on Facebook, which means that Mm -hmm. supply and stay fixed, demand keeps going up and up and up. And the only way to level out demand to make sure they don't oversell ads is to increase the price and get rid of Mm -hmm. demand. Um, so if you cut out some of these advertisers and make it too expensive to advertise, you lose that chunk of demand. Demand comes back down. Supply needs to, you need to lower the price to increase that balance. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's like economics nerd talk, but, but basically <laughs> it, it'll balance out pricing once those mm-hmm. people get wiped down. No, that was really helpful. Um, and I know a lot of people in this group are, um, <clears throat> marketers for local businesses, small businesses, mainly businesses that have one central location or maybe four locations that are in a close proximity. My interpretations of the changes is that it's not going to hurt those marketers that much because we're less reliant on targeting than the people that are running the national campaigns that are pretty heavily reliant on targeting behaviors, interests, and all that good stuff. Um, it's true. And also, if, of, you're, yeah, if you're a business, like if you're a coffee shop or a gym, again, mm-hmm. lifetime value. Like you can, uh, gyms have been doing that for a long time before Facebook. Like if, mm-hmm. if you know, my month one sign up is $90. I'll pay $90 mm-hmm. to get that customer all day long. I'll pay 120, 150 to get the customer all day long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a lot of, I mean, a lot of local businesses do not have good value ladders and don't really know how to upsell. Um, so that's important to go in there with that mindset and really consult them on that for anybody who's yeah. on this live, make sure you have a consulting package as well. Um, but Derek, uh, my dude is asking you a question. He hopes it makes sense. So hopefully it does make sense. Um, another, (laughs) another question about the changes. Um, so does this mean we as digital entrepreneurs, uh, should be building pixel data list, uh, bot subs, et cetera. Um, because it is literally our assets. Um, restaurant owners have a building equipment, et cetera. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. So you should, yeah, I mean, you should totally be, if you don't have an email list, a messenger list, a text list, if you don't have tangible lists that you can, you know, export onto a CSV or a thumb drive and take with you anywhere, um, mm-hmm. that's a problem. So, you know, messenger is a little trickier because who owns that data? I mean, it's, it's a little, a little more gray. Um, mm-hmm. doesn't mean you should be built. I mean, Messenger is so freaking powerful. You should 100% be building your, your bot subscribers. 
but I'm still also a, a big fan of building up your email and text list. Yep. Um, for, you know, it's not going to perform as well as messenger, but it has the added benefit of, you know, you can take that data with you. It doesn't matter if MailChimp shuts down or AWeber shuts down or Infusionsoft, you have that CRM, um, that, that data, and you can also use it for, Hey, let's say there's a new Facebook that pops up in five years, like, and they have a lookalike feature, like you have starting data. Um, so it is a, it's an asset. Um, mm -hmm. and you should be looking to build up assets for your business. 110%. And every business should be building community. So yep. you have a tripwire into some type of community. So every stinking business, but digital entrepreneurs included, should be building Facebook groups, should be building their Instagram list or followers should be building their email list, should be building their bot subscriber list, have them amongst various platforms and just recycle your content across platforms. So you're not wasting a lot of time creating different content for different platforms, but you should be building up as many platforms as you can. Um, really focus on one at first, build that up and then build out the rest um, and uh, YouTube subscribers as well. So I'm trying to go more towards Instagram um, and YouTube uh, in the next year or so. So everybody should be doing that um, and local yeah. businesses included. Um, but awesome. We have consulting package. Awesome. Um, a lot of people want to meet you, Max. <laughs> I'm jealous. I would say in the back of that while you're looking through any questions and stuff and, and feel free guys. Like it doesn't have to be face. I, I always kind of get pigeonholed a little bit on, on the Facebook side of things. Um, but you know, Jeremy and I are running, we run multiple companies. Um, and, and so we've dealt with the entrepreneur, the work-life balance, everything. So they're, uh, you know, you can branch out the questions. Don't feel like you have to ask any Facebook related questions if you don't want to. Um, but, but what I say is what you said at the end, like diversification mm -hmm. is so critical. And, uh, and that ties into this Facebook issue. Like if, if your first reaction when all this stuff happened was, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to have a business. Like that's not Facebook's fault. That's your fault. But yeah. that's a problem with your business model. You should never be 100% dependent on any one traffic source or any one sales source. So if right now you are 100% dependent on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube for all of your traffic, you need to take a step back today and, and look at diversification. You know, mm -hmm. Spread out some of that ad dollars across multiple platforms. The same thing is true on the sales side. If all of your sales right now are coming from Amazon or if all your sales are coming just from Shopify or they're all coming from physical brick and mortar location, like diversify your sales channels as well because you don't know mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Jeff Bezos could decide, hey, tomorrow I want to start this type of business. And you're going to go out of business overnight. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people think like, that would be crazy. It's not going to happen. I know multiple people who are making seven figures a month on Amazon and went out of business. Like literally almost overnight, their business was evaporated, which mm -hmm. is insane. I know the guy that in one of my masterminds, board of advisors, um, the, the guy who set the, the biggest, he was the first person to do a million dollars in a day on Amazon. So he set that record. First guy to do a million dollars in a day. He also owns like 50 of the top listings on Amazon. If you search stars on Amazon, he owns that listing, like crazy stuff. Um, mm -hmm. He's in two lawsuits on Amazon. Like that's how crazy it is between Amazon and their sellers. It, it's not a, a healthy relationship um, and it's definitely a risky one. So you just mm -hmm. want to make sure you're diversified because Amazon can be the holy grail. It can be great for a while. You can make tons and tons of money without spending any money on ads. Um, but it's also, you know, risk with reward, right? There, there's a risk reward balance and with a lot of reward comes a lot of risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that I really wanted to get into that's smacking me right in the face right now uh, is branding. The unicorn mm -hmm. on your hat, the unicorn in the back, uh, unicorn, unicorn, unicorn. Yes, How'd you come yes, up with that? Yesterday. <laughs> unicorn University. And uh, you just got socks too, right? Unicorn we socks. Did. The socks are sick, yeah. We have hoodies coming in. We got um, so a few badass different variations of tees coming in. So, yeah, we got we got lots of stuff coming in. That's awesome. So I'd love for you to break down why marketers do that, why, market, why, why people brand in general, and what was your thought process around building the unicorn brand? Sure. I 
So I think beyond the brand, branding is is a very big term, and it applies to companies, individuals, and, and kind of everything in between. Um, what it comes down to is is recognition, right? So this idea of being omnipresent and mm-hmm. top of mind is mm-hmm. so critical when you're selling things. When you're in a business and you're trying to get people to give you money, the one of the first things that happens when somebody goes to to a store or a shopping experience is they look at the brands, right? They look at all the competition. So you go to the supermarket and you're walking down the aisle and you see your favorite cereal, you see a bunch of cereals, right? And there's maybe this new brand there and stuff, but right next to it is Lucky Charms or a brand that you've been eating since you were you know, a kid. Like you, you, we go with the brand we know and the brand we recognize. They can be the exact same thing, right? You can go into a store in the razor aisle and it can be two identical products and the one could even be cheaper, but we go with the one we know. And the same thing is true with brands. Um, if you see ads from somebody pitching you a Facebook course or trying to sell you a mastermind or whatever it is, and you don't know that person, you don't recognize them, it's a really hard sell. It is very, very difficult to sell a thousand dollar course to somebody that has no clue who you are. Like it happens, mm-hmm. like we've still, it's happened to us before, but the, the reality is that you need to have multiple touches with that person mm-hmm. and then there's even multiple identifiers, right? So with us, with like the, the branding and stuff, it's everywhere you are, you're exposing people in multiple areas, like with you, with your brand, with your identity and, and that constant exposure, especially like little doses. So the little mm-hmm. thing here, little thing there, it builds a very, very strong long-term bond and relationship with that person. Yep. Um, and, and so that's why pretty much every big brand you see, like they're everywhere. Like they're omnipresent. All the big B to C companies, the big consumer package companies, like they advertise everywhere and mm-hmm. they advertise on everything. They put their logo on billboards, banners on race cars, on astronauts, like they yep. see, like, you know, they, they put it everywhere because they want to get their logo, their branding, their colors in front of your eyeballs and as many different eyeballs as frequently as possible. Um, and especially the, the difference to the final thing with why we do like gear and stuff is in subtle ways, right? Mm-hmm. Cause it's one thing to, uh, to be omnipresent, but be really annoying about it. Meaning mm-hmm. that like I could just saturate people with an impression based advertising and make small custom audiences and just hit you all day long with Facebook ads. Like I could do it all day long, really cheaply by just bidding on impressions, using small segments and just saturating your feed. I could do that. Um, yeah. But nobody's going to like me or want to buy from me. It's kind of a negative impact. Right. Whereas if we advertise the way we're advertising and then focus on putting a lot of organic content and then also use a lot of our branding and that element of it, it it's a much more organic and, and passive way to build that, that relationship with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to your second it. question, which is why, yep. why the, the unicorn? Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the, the unicorn is a term for a billion dollar company. And that's been around for, for quite some time. Um, Eileen page from, or drawing a blank from the, uh, the name of the venture capital firm that she was a general partner at, um, coined the term like 10, I think 2007, 2008. And, um, and so like for us, it's, you know, unicorn has like double meaning one, it's, it's a billion dollar company. And also it's this, you know, super rare mythical thing. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, we wanted to make sure like people realize like, you know, we're going to be a billion dollar company and we also, we're not like anybody else, right. You're a unicorn. You're, you stand out from the pack. You're different. N- nothing's like mm-hmm. you. And so it really fit, um, with our identity, who we wanted to be as a company. And it also has given us, like, we knew from day one that we wanted to have a brand that we can have a lot of fun with. Mm-hmm. So you can go two routes, right? You can go like the, the corporate route and play a real safe like and pick like a very yeah. generic name or you can put your initials together, which is like, you know, my, all, all our holding companies, like our, our entities that own all our equity, like those are boring, right? MTF Ventures, like that's that's my my company that owns everything. Mm-hmm. But, um, but for our company, like we wanted this to be super fun. We wanted to make sure we could do all kinds of cool things with it. And you know, at the end of the day, there's people that don't like it but it's, we'd rather be polarizing and have yeah, that, like a group of people love and it's okay. If people hate it because that means yeah. there's also a group of people that love it that much more. Love it. Um, Kathy has a really good question here. Uh, if you can go back to when you're starting out. Um, so she's asking, I'm trying to start an agency, but feel um, I can't learn uh, them 
I think the various softwares. Um, all does anybody outsource? Um, should I keep I get learning all them? Yeah, it's a little yep. overwhelming. Yep. So what I would say, Kathy, is do not try to be a generalist. Um, I think the, the the surest way to 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 create a a company that doesn't like have any upward mobility is to become a generalist because there's mm -hmm. so many people competing in that space right now that wants to get it all. And it's tempting because like we had this issue when we started a quantum or AG with Kevin, where we had a client come to us and they were like, Hey, well, can you guys help me with this? Like we have this landing page we built. Can you build the funnel up? Hey, can you do the email sequences for us? We'll write you this check. We'll write you this check. And it's, it's so easy to take money from people. Yeah. It's easy in the world to take cash from people. Um, taking the right money is a whole nother story. And a lot of people don't know how to do that well. So when you become a generalist, you, you basically, you're building somebody else's company without getting a fraction of the compensation without the ownership. You're never going to be great at any one thing. It's impossible to be great at everything. It's impossible to be great at five things. You, you probably can be great at like one or two things tops. Um, and, and I would rather be great at one or two things, charge an ultra premium, have much fewer clients that I can really work personal level and grow really heavily than to try to be okay at everything, have semi happy clients that pay me very low because we're doing low quality work. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer would be, I, I would not try to be a generalist. I would mm -hmm. focus on what am I passionate about, what I really love doing, become an expert in that, become an authority in that. Because that's mm -hmm. the other thing. Nobody's an authority in being a generalist. Like there's nobody out there that, <laughs> hey, that's that guy that's good at everything, right? Like <laughs> it doesn't happen. Even, you know, Grant Cardone, like Grant Cardone is a salesman. Like he's great at selling stuff. And he brings on experts to do other things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Gary is kind of like a gem, but even Gary, like he he's great at the imp, like building that that content. Like he's selectively great at what he did. Like it's it's complicated with him, but but yeah. pretty much everybody else is great at a few things. That's what you know him for. Russell's the funnel guy. You know, yeah. Chris Record is the you know affiliate marketer. Pat Flynn, affiliate marketer, podcaster. Like Ezra Firestone, Facebook and Shopify. Those those are mm -hmm. how you identify mm -hmm. um, people. So yeah, focus on, on one or two things, become great at that, charge an ultra premium, um, don't compete on price. That's that's a surefire way to uh, to get into a point where you hate what you're doing um, because you have a ton of clients mm -hmm. that are paying a very, very low amount. Those are the people that ask for the most and that are usually the least happy. Um, and they mm -hmm. they like complain, it's it's a nightmare dealing with those types of clients. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely do that. And then, and then partner for everything else, right? Like we have partners that we've built relationships with over the years that are great at all these other things. So, hey, mm -hmm. you, we're doing Facebook ads for you and stuff, but you need um, a badass website built, you need Messenger, you need you know landing pages, whatever it is. Hey, yep. we got this partner over here, they're the best in the world at it, and we have a deal with them, we have a referral relationship, and they pay us a piece of that. And then we have passive income coming in, because now we're getting paid monthly, and we're doing nothing. We made the introduction, mm -hmm. and now we're getting a, a piece every month, and that's a beautiful business. Like That's what you should be aspiring to do. Mm -hmm. is just do what you love, stay in your lane, sub everything else out to partners and collect checks from them. Yeah, I totally agree. And being a solo entrepreneur is really tough starting out, especially yeah. when you're trying to find your own path and what you're actually gonna sell. Um, learn a process and get really good at it. Like one of the best examples that I could that, that who just freaking killed it. Uh, Jordan Parker. He's a solo entrepreneur. Um, he works just with chiropractors, and he has one process that generates huge results for chiropractors. Just leads. So yeah. he does a Facebook ad into a funnel into like one or two emails, and he does the same thing for every chiropractor. So it's basically copy and paste across chiropractors and he got really, really good at one niche. If he tried to be a generalist and tried to make everybody happy and started working with gyms too and uh, any other industry, then he wouldn't have been able to get to that level with chiropractors where he's just able to do that one process over and over and over and it saves him a lot of time. So just another little tip in there. And you can get to that point, right? So while you're going through some other questions, like you, you yep. can get to that point where, hey, I've capped this market. Because right, there's only so many chiropractors. So at some point, if you if you if you totally max that market, 
But now you, you are the king of that market. You've created a system of flow, a massive thing of loyal customer, you know, customer base. And mm -hmm. do you think that those chiropractors don't have some doctor friends or don't have some mm -hmm. gym friends? Mm -hmm. Like then it's easy to move to another vertical. Hey, I crushed the chiropractor space. Now I'm going to try my hand at gyms, but now I can mm -hmm. start at the top price point wise and already have a huge foundation to work with. But if you stay laser, you know, stay laser focused to get to that point, and then you can look at expanding. But trying to do it early on is super, super risky. Right. And what I would say to me is produce a result in one niche first, and then stick to that niche. And then when you get really, really good at that niche, then you can expand to other ones. And at that hiring people and uh, outsourcing a little bit more. Um, and like Max said, you can always partner with other businesses to um, outsource other processes or systems or flows. Exactly. Um, so Mark Foster has a question here. Uh, tips on time management, please, Max slash Andrew. Uh, how do you stay focused and not lose those hours watching stupid videos or reading news. <laughs> do you want to take that one first? Or do you want me to take that? Um, yeah, I'll take it. Um, I uh, either you're consuming or you're creating. Um, and I've found over the past half year is that I don't consume that much anymore. Like if I, I, I have a goal in mind with my business um, and if I have questions along the way, like Max said, I'll reach out to somebody that, uh, I, that can answer my questions. So if I'm trying to get X done, I have somebody to reach out to that I can talk to for like 30 minutes and then that problem gets solved. I don't really consume that much anymore. So making a differentiation between consuming and creating, I feel like people just really, really over consume right off the bat and they think they don't know enough. And it's really the, it's not that they don't know enough. It's that they don't have a direction. And the way you yes. get a direction is by um, landing a client or doing something for free for a client. And then you have a direction and then you can learn uh, along the way when you have that focal point, that direction to go. So time management really comes down to uh, really you need to have more goals and more lighthouses to aim for. And then just figuring things out along the way. Um if you are getting distracted by videos or news or something like that, I really think it's an issue of not having that one thing to aim for and not having that goal, uh, that end goal in mind. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I'm actually, I, I, I'm trying to spend more time like consuming a little bit cause I, I, I probably don't read or watch as much as I should. Um, <laughs> but it does, you do notice that, um, you know, there's a transition point once you get to a certain point where you you start getting results and becoming an authority. And, and now you're all about like, I'm testing, practicing, implementing and talking about it, sharing it and learning from others who are doing the same. There's this, uh, I see the same people on the circuit, like the mastermind and the event circuit. And I don't really, I don't like going to events. Like I purposely don't go to a lot of them because I think it's it's a great networking opportunity. I think you, somebody from your team should be there, but at the same time, it's a very very dangerous slope um, where you just go to event after event after event and think like with the mentality that my business is going to grow. And the truth mm -hmm. is that nobody has become a millionaire or a billionaire attending events. Right? Yeah. The only people that have become millionaires and billionaires attending events are the people that attend, come home and implement, and then mm -hmm. work on it. Right? Um, mm -hmm. I love speaking at events because I like helping people do that, but. I do feel bad sometimes speaking at events and seeing the same people. I'm like, what have you done since the last time I spoke? And they really haven't gotten anywhere. They're kind of spinning their wheels and it is, it is scary and it, it's sad because I, I see a lot of people and it's like this mentality that if I just take enough courses and attend enough events, my business is going to grow. And it's, that's just not how it works, right? You need to learn, you need to network, but at the same time, like doing is so much more valuable, doing, failing, mm -hmm. learning, tweaking mm -hmm. and redoing like with mentors and with support, that's a model for success. Attending events, attending events, attending events, 
and then like hoping, like looking at your numbers, this is going to change is not a, a recipe. Like nothing yeah. happens there. Yeah. And you're going to learn vastly more by doing and failing than you ever would by watching a video in a course or online oh, yeah. through YouTube. So just do it, fail forward, fall on your face, and you'll learn a lot, lot more. Um, John Trapp um, has a question here. Uh, do I base my consulting package as a case by case basis, depending on uh, what they need, or should I have just one set number uh, for what I think my time is worth? Um, Max, I don't know how much yeah. consulting you do, but um, go ahead and jump into that. Sure. So, um, really, don't do any hourly anymore. We um, just, you know, set the number to a point where it's like, hey, if somebody wants to pay that, that will do it. But really, don't promote it or push it. Um, mm -hmm. We have various packages. We have our, you know, our, our private group coaching, which is a, you know, 10, 12 person group. And that's several thousand a month. Um, so we have a set price there for us to basically like run traffic. We just set a, a minimum retainer. And then we also might actually we always do like we'll work something out on a CPA profit share equity basis. So we stop doing deals really where we like don't have any skin in the game. And so most mm -hmm. of our deals now going forward, we want to make sure that we have skin in the game because what we do is so valuable that like we don't want to build somebody else's business to like an eight, nine figure business and just keep getting paid, uh, you know, $15,000 a month or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's important to have systems and standards. So set a minimum retainer and go with that and, and don't be deterred because some people say, no, that's too expensive. That I've seen so many mm -hmm. people do that. And we used to do that. Like you get flexible in price. You're like, Oh, well they said that's too high. This other person that's too high. Maybe we should come down. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people are not right customers for you. Um, mm -hmm. you know, for us, like 99.9% .9 of people are not a good fit for us. And that's why we don't like, we have an application to, to come work with us before we talk to you. But like, we just tell people, listen, it's probably not a good fit. Like, you know, it's not gonna be the best interest for everybody. We charge almost a premium. Um, and, and this is what makes sense for us. So yeah, come up with, with a set number and a minimum retainer. Usually if you're doing any type of ad, you know, ad management, it's going to be a flat, flat fee, then a percent of ad spend, whichever is higher. So if you're, you know, you're managing hundred thousand dollars a month and your, you know, retainer is $10,000 or 15% of ad spend, you're going to get 15 grand. Um, if it was 10,000, you're going to get 10,000. So it's whatever, whatever those two numbers is higher. And, uh, and that should be good. You can do the same thing for consulting, right? You have, you know, a set amount there mm -hmm. and, you know, set scope of work, hours, services, and make sure you, you honor that. Right. Cause like, if you don't specify to the client exactly what they're getting, exactly what to expect they're going to overstep boundaries right if you don't give them boundaries they're going to push push and push they're going to try to get as much for their dollar as possible and you'll be getting clients that call you text you slack you have 100 questions a week so make sure you set up that clear agenda make sure you set clear communication guidelines like we talk once a week we have phone calls twice a month and the rest is via slack or whatever it is like that mm -hmm. means that that's so much more important than even the money because mm -hmm. you can go crazy with some like consulting clients if you don't set that ahead of time. Absolutely. Um, starting out, what I did with my consulting was it was baked into my package. So uh, we do biweekly strategy sessions. So you see so much more value in your services when you are providing strategy as well instead of just managing their Facebook ads. So I would bake that into my packages. And there were actually a lot of clients that I didn't want to freaking work with or run Facebook ads for. So I would just offer them a consulting package that was $500 for an hour. Um, and we would just go over their strategy. Usually it went into an hour and a half. Um, but their digital marketing strategy. And really all I did there was read dot com secrets and read expert secrets. And then everything that I learned in those two books, I just spat out during those meetings and adapted that to what their business plan really looked like. Um, so yeah, if you're just starting yeah. out, that's the basic, that's the basic route you could use. Um, yeah. Uh, Keenan would, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> <laughs> um news feed bring your house and focus um cool solid advice not seeing um arthur or is it arthur i'm not sure it's missing the age um how do you acquire your first client so how would you suggest to somebody that they acquire their first agency client 
<sighs> That's a good question. Um, see, here's the thing with, with the, the agency world. I think it's, um, it's hard to get into with like, as a total newbie, meaning that like, I have no track record. I have no brand or anything like, a lot of our agency business, even early on, has always come from word of mouth or organically. We've done like very, very little outbound sales for any of our agencies, even with Quantum when we first started out. Um, we just had a lot of relationship capital. So I think what that leads into is, uh, you know, networking and, and putting yourself out there and going to events where there are other business owners. Um, early on, you're, you probably, if it's like a first client to run traffic before, you're probably going to have to do some stuff on a performance basis for free. That's just the way it works. Like very, you're not, it's going to be very, very hard to find somebody that's going to pay you a retainer or a flat amount or a percent of spend without any past data, track record, anything like that. So you might have to work a deal and say, hey, listen, I'm brand new to the industry, but I'm super ambitious. I'm going to work really, really hard. I've taken all these trainings. I've worked my ass off. I've done some tests of my own. Um, how about we do a deal? You let me try the thousand dollars this month. And if I bring you back a return greater than this, you pay me this or something like that, where it's a, mm -hmm. it's a win-win for them. Um, that's usually a model that you're going to start with when you're, when you're new, or mm -hmm. if you have some cash, like you probably have to go to the affiliate marketing route and, and run some traffic for affiliate products, get some data and results, and then bring that to some prospects to show them, Hey, listen, I ran this offer. This is what mm -hmm. I did. Usually try to find an offer that's in a niche that you want to be in. So it's, it's likable. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, similar. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there's really, there's not like a great go-to outbound strategy for at least for like a startup to yeah. like, you know, cold call or outbound with forgetting agent clients. It's going to be mm -hmm. a lot of networking and, and word of mouth initially. Yeah. I love that answer. Um, I, I didn't do that starting out. I started out from ground freaking zero. Um, so I think I can provide a little bit of value on this, this question. Um, but when I was starting out, I did trials for free. So it was a week free. I was running their Facebook ads, asked for $150 worth of ad spend. Um, I did door to door sales. So I walked into a shit ton of restaurants. I walked into a shit ton of gyms. I walked into a shit ton of chiropractors and landed one from each three, uh, those three industries. So my first three trials were uh, a restaurant, um, a gym, and a chiropractor. Um, and they actually went pretty freaking well. Um, for a gym, we got 35 leads for a one week free trial for that gym and just put it on Facebook. Um, and then for a restaurant, we got 250 email addresses in one week uh, with like $130 worth of ad spend. Um, and then for the chiropractor, we got him um, 15 leads in one week for, it was, uh, it was around 150 bucks. Um, so then what I was able to do is leverage those results when I went into uh, a gym again or a chiropractor in a restaurant. That's how I grew from there, just doing that stuff for free. And what I did was door to door sales off the bat. Um, but also what works really, really well is having a referral program in place, telling your friends and family that you're doing this and that you're offering 200 to $500 uh, if a piece of business um, closes. Um, or uh, B&I meetings and Chamber of Commerce meetings. Um, those work really, really well because you're in people's faces and you can just offer a free trial or you can try to get the sale right off the bat, but I don't suggest it if you haven't really tested your stuff out yet. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I hate to do this too, because I have actually have a call with, uh, with Adrian at, at eight and, um, I've actually got to go too. It's my brother's birthday. I got to hang out with him. Is it? But yeah. What are you doing with me here? You should be out having fun with your having fun with your brother. We're going to the casino, so we will. Oh, so. nice. You guys are gonna have some fun. But I want to make sure that, like, I, um, you know, like anybody has any questions for me, like I, I'll check this comment thread and and I'll reply, you know, to my tomorrow. And uh, they're more than awesome. anybody's more than welcome to to shoot me a you know direct message or whatever, and I can can. I love it. And everybody here, uh, join Maxwell's group. He'll drop the link down below. It's Unicorn IQ. Is that the name yep. of the group? Yep. yep. Unicorn IQ Hub. Awesome. Join that group. It's freaking awesome. Maxwell is dropping value all the time and having awesome, awesome interviews. Um, and 
Max, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think so. My, uh, everybody got a lot out of this, so thank you. Of course, it's a, it's awesome, man. And one last thing: if anybody's interested, we're, we're running this like this really crazy deal till midnight tonight. Um, if you're interested, shoot me a message. I want to make sure like Andrew gets credit for it, um, just because like, I didn't set up time to track anything. So if you're interested in basically getting all of our courses and all of our trainings, basically twelve thousand dollars of courses, trainings, everything, Jesus, um, for like an insane deal, it ends at midnight. Just uh, you know like tag me or something in the comments or shoot me a message just so I can track you individually and I'll follow up with the, the link and stuff. I just want, I didn't have time to make like a custom link and stuff for you, but I want to make sure yeah, no, that's cool. that, uh, that you get, you get your, your share of, of anything. So uh, pay you back. Yeah, no, all, yeah. All of Max's <laughs> stuff is high quality. There's no way you can't get results if you just implement it. So definitely reach out to him and see what he's offering and, um, and take it from there. You guys. Awesome. Thanks so much Thanks, for having Max. me. Man. Yeah, Later. thank you. Have a good night, buddy.